Uh, so thank you, John. Everyone, let's have a round of applause for John. For sure. Facebook engineers have joined 
a number of implementers uh, as well. So like from Google or uh, Mozilla. It's really exciting. A lot of people are really pushing forward meeting that uh, 2014 deadline. So anyway, enough about that. I want to introduce to you tonight the panelists who are going to first uh, say a little bit about themselves. I'm actually going to run down the line real quick. And then once I get to the end, we're going to loop back and uh, we will say a little bit about your vision for ES6. And then after that, uh, we've got questions queued up on Google Moderator. So I will be selecting the ones that I think are great and uh, the ones that you've all voted on and also think are great. Um, please try to hold questions, hand raise questions, until afterwards. The moderator questions were in line before you, right? <coughs> so let's be fair and, and sort of address those things. Um, so, ready? Let's go. The man who needs very little introduction, I'm sure, is Douglas Crawford. <laughs> Uh, 
I got involved with the English Committee about three years ago, I guess, um, and had been working on uh, ES6 during that period. Uh, I, uh, like Raphael said, I think um, there's, a, there's a few things generally that, that I sort of am sort of passionate about in JavaScript space. Um, one, I uh, sort of a big believer in sort of scaling up JavaScript application development um, and doing things both in, in ECMAScript that can help us to, to make it easier to build large, uh, large robust pieces of software um, in JavaScript. Um, but I've also been involved with a project called TypeScript at Microsoft, um, where we've uh, been adding uh, static typing on top of uh, ECMAScript. Um, the other sort of general theme that I'm sort of passionate about is uh, compatibility and uh, sort of sure that as we evolve around it, we do so in a, in a relatively clean way as possible. Um, and that's been something that I think is, uh, is, is always a challenge as you go and try to evolve a language which has as many uh, use cases, as much um, different variety of things being done on top of it as JavaScript does. Um, we have to be really, really careful on how we really do evolve that over time. And that's something that we obviously spend a lot of time on. Uh, in, in, uh, so that's that is so true. I think Luke said we spent three hours today arguing over just one point of um, DS6 convention. One bit. One bit. <laughs> Whether type to raise or extensible. Um, what chakra is chakra made up with? I'm going to go with the heart. Uh, there's, there's seven. Uh, so um, I think between my fellow panelists and others on TC right now, we are going to keep evolving the language. You know, ES5 is done, ES6 is kind of half done in browsers even. You can use parts of it that are in, in Chrome under a flag in V8 and in Spider Monkey. And we're also doing ES7 in parallel. We're trying to do rapid error standards releases. Not, not every six weeks, but um, when things are ready, get them out in smaller packages as quickly as possible. Um, John talked about 2014, but that's really when you finish all the pretty typography. And before then, you have to have testing. So developers have to try the new stuff, and they have to be sure about it. The we'll always leave some bad parts until Doug can write a sequel to his book. But um, <laughs> so far, so good. JavaScript was is, is one of the huge rest job, and part of what I had to do was make it really extensible and movable and hackable because I knew it was going to need hacking by developers. And I, I think that was a survival, of, you know, a fitness advantage for it, because languages like ActionScript and Flash, there's several versions of Java in the JRE, the Java plugin, were much more rigid and controlled in several levels of discourse. Like they were controlled by their proprietors, they were also more locked down as to how you guys could hack on them. And the mutability of JavaScript, though it's not great for security, um, it had two effects. It let developers explore a very large design space in parallel. Whereas remember, you guys can make libraries like JavaScript and jQuery. And it also kept the early language from jumping too far ahead on one path and getting stuck. That, I think, was an, a real advantage for JavaScript to spread and, and provided the performance came along was good, um, really prevailed. Now, I think there are gaps to fill, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight. Obviously, backwards compatibility is a huge concern for TC39. But in an imaginary world where breaking existing apps wasn't a concern, what feature would you be most eager to add, modify, or remove from JavaScript? Um, and in no particular order, raise your hands. I'll bring you the mic. Can I just go down with it? Oh, sure, we can do that. So I don't think that's a fair question. This, that is not an opportunity that's in front of TC39. We cannot consider that kind of thing. If we could, I would advocate throwing the whole thing out and starting over. <laughs> I love JavaScript. It, it's been a very good language for me. It has taught me a lot. And the thing that distinguishes great languages from ordinary languages is how much it can teach you. And there is an education in this language if, if you're willing to, to invest in it. And 
for that I'm grateful. But trauma script is a wounded language, right? Where we feel the scars constantly, right, Alan? I mean, <laughs> Alan feels them like they're his scars sometimes. Um, no, they're mine. <laughs> you know, so if we could make a breaking change, I would say break the whole thing. So I have two, I have two answers. Um, I guess the first one is, which is a lie, but it's nothing. Because if JavaScript wasn't what it was right now, which is a very much what it was 10 plus years ago, it just wouldn't, I don't think it would be in the position it's in. So um, it'd only go backwards. Uh, and the second answer, which is also flippant, is the DOM. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> it's funny. I, when I walked over here this morning, Alex Russell and I were talking about how, how frustrating CSS can be. And, um, you know, I, certainly I have annoyances with both the DOM and with JavaScript. And, you know, I, I think that one thing I notice a lot working at Google, I'm sure Microsoft, other, you know, lots of very lots of smart engineers have a tendency to want to look at something and identify the faults and think, well, if we just start over, we'll, we'll end up in a better place. And I don't actually happen to agree with that. I think that when something is successful, it necessarily grows and works. And, you know, and you can almost tell how successful something has been by kind of strange elbows and arms and eyes that has grown up, you know, different sides because it attracts different constituencies, different people have different agendas, and I think almost by necessity you end up in strange places with things that, you know, decisions that made sense, you know, 10 years ago no longer make sense. And, um, yeah, I, 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 think, uh, I think, I think it's actually pretty good. Yeah, I feel like uh, everyone's sort of agreeing up here, and, and I, I agree as well. I think that uh, JavaScript really, you know, as Brendan was saying, was successful for a whole bunch of reasons, which many of those reasons really are the same sorts of things that people criticize the language for. Um, but it was because it had those problems, it was very hackable, it was very mutable. Um, that meant that it could actually evolve, that all these could be built, that people could um, always fill certain APIs, and the evolution could happen in a much more sort of organic way. Um, but, but those all, every one of those sort of benefits has some other downsides, which in other scenarios it doesn't like, you know, feel, like a, feel like a negative. But I think it's, it's impossible to sort of to go back and say, well, we should change this thing because then you know, we wouldn't have a language that the competition which actually has gotten to. Um, and I think there's plenty of things that now, you know, you can evolve and make languages better without going back and breaking things. You can go and sort of, uh, Make sure that the ads that people are doing, which are going to be doing best practices development, where they're reading Doug's book and then following the guidance it has, and to make sure that those patterns are increasingly more of um, the direction the language points you to more towards those kind of ads and evolve in ways which really do help people to find the common patterns that they need to do. Um, and I think you can do that without breaking and without changing the sort of fundamental characteristics of what they wanted to get. Function view is too long. <laughs> so I talked to TXJS, the great regional foundries in Austin, Texas, about um, the biologist Lynn Margulies. Um, she was uh, kind of ahead of time pointing out what looked like endosymbiosis, the, the mitochondria, how our cells look like early bacteria that got lodged inside and became symbiotic. Um, and so you can look at them and say, oh, how stupid, you know, 37 genes and a 16,000 mixed pair is not enough. There's the list statement. Oh, we should get rid of that. Um, you don't get to do that. You don't get to take out stuff without big risk. That you'll create some mutant monster or you know, start some kind of viral problem. So the web is like that. But we aren't just um, passive, you know, molecules. We, we, we have great um, languages to draw from. Uh, I drew from C in a big grade. It made it look like Java, but Java was based on C++, which was based on C, so I mostly made it look like C. And function actually came from awk. Kind of embarrassing. Um, the for in loop came from awk. Um, but, you know, you can't go back, and you can go forward. You can get painted into a corner. You know, the, the dinosaurs get up a box canyon and get extinguished. It's sad. Um, but JavaScript is nowhere near going extinct, in my opinion. I don't know how many years it has. Alan said 30 or 40. 
uh, it's spin 18, uh, less than halfway on the outside. So I think we can evolve it compatibly. Sometimes you can build on these more solid foundations. Other times we have to make a new and cleaner path based on solid results from other languages or nearby languages and sort of leave the old stuff to fade away. Um, maybe it'll be around in 20 years, but well, it will hardly be used. You know, actually, I'll come back. To, I'll come down that way. And we'll, we'll start. It'll be the runner. <laughs> so, um, an interesting one, a little bit more technical. Um, how has mobile browsing affected the strategy and direction of ECMAScript? You know, there's big problems with the web standards, including the way the whole system works across the layers and doing a DNS request and then loading some HTML and starting to fire off, you know, image loads to the, the CDN and pretty soon these things are like staggered badly and powering up and down the radio and burning your battery. That's all fixable, but it needs to work with the network layer more than anywhere else and some coordination across the whole system, um, which, which I think we can do. And I think people at Mozilla and Google are looking at this. It won't require replacing everything. I think it can be done incrementally. JavaScript is actually doing okay in our experience. We're doing Firefox OS at Mozilla. We don't have a native development kit. We use JavaScript. When we need to do native ports, we use Inscript and Asm.js. And we're down to one and a fraction slower than native code. We're running you know, Epic Games on the Engine. So I'm not too worried about JavaScript for mobile, though there is concern about things like module loading and script tags. We don't want to make more synchronous blocking, janking hazards. So things like uh, synchronous module loading cannot be initiated from a script tag. We made sure that thanks to all of that one. One of the things I, uh, we've seen generally is um, as you go to mobile, the, um, the impact of parse time goes up as sort of a, a more, more significant factor um, in the, the application experience. And so we've seen a lot of teams building uh, fairly large uh, web applications inside Microsoft uh, having to deal with um, the amount of script they have that's going into the mobile app at that. That's something that's now um, becomes more of a pain point as more of the users are uh, coming to mobile. Um, and I think that, you know, the engines have done a lot of work to try and reduce parse time, make sure that they're not parsing anything which isn't going to get executed, trying to defer as much of that work as possible. Um, and the, from the language perspective, that's interesting because the language can do things which make it incrementally harder to do those kinds of optimizations. So we've had several discussions in the working group over the last year about specific ways where things we were thinking about doing might inadvertently make it very hard to optimize, uh, to defer parse or defer other things early on in that pipeline, uh, which would have uh, proportionally uh, bigger impacts on the uh, mobile business. <coughs> That was a very complete answer. I don't have very much more to add to that. I, I, I was just going to say generally the constraints of, of the limited hardware that's available on mobile is, is offers a, you know a, a set of real challenges, um, not just for ECMAScript but for the browser as a whole. Um, I'm aware of you know uh, in, a lot of interest in reducing compute time, reducing memory usage, just generally. I think it's, I think it's, it's important, especially because a lot of the high volume devices have even lower memory and, and CPU. Uh, uh, basically, I think it's just, you know, the mobile web just reinforces the importance of the, the whole web technology stack. So. JavaScript is a general purpose programming language. It knows nothing about the web. So we don't have to teach it anything about mobile. It's just something to write programs. So I really like that answer. I was thinking very similar answer myself. Um, you were right. Yes, well, I'm going to add, gonna add a, a few notes about this. Um, I, th I think it's, don't think about JavaScript necessarily as, as uh, the language you're going to write web pages or, you know, things that run in a browser. Think of it as uh, what you're going to write uh, any sort of program with, uh, as Doug has always said for, you know, 14 years of blog posts. It's, it's a general purpose program. You do other things with it. So when like, as far as I'm concerned, uh, very specific things that, that mobile web benefits from in the evolution of a, a general purpose program languages are, uh, you know, bundling in uh, the term that we use is uh, even cow paths, or my favorite is cow highways, things that are like incredibly obvious. So, uh, ah. right, right, so, you know, like, well, Raphael didn't even mention 
things like object observe. Well, he's actually one of the principal designers of that, which is the S7, right? That actually is going to reduce the amount of bytes over the wire you're actually going to have to ship because now you have uh, you know, a native object observation, right? Um, it's building templates with uh, template string liberals, right? Th these are things that are now like rolled into the language. You don't have to think about sending another script tag. However, you're going to bundle it. Um, it's probably a faux pas that you send script tag. But anyway, I wanted to say that these, these are things that weren't thought of with mobile web in mind, but their mobile web obviously benefits from their existence in JavaScript as a JavaScript program. So anyway, we're going to wrap it up and move to the next question. <clears throat> so, our audience would love to know. Um, wait, give me a second. I was thinking about my response. <laughs> There's been a lot of questions about modules, and it's really unfortunate uh, because Dave Herman and uh, Sam Tobin Hochstadt couldn't be here to actually answer this question. But Dave just texted me and said, we wanted you all to know, uh, they're cool, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm actually going to skip some of these because they're pretty um, This is an interesting one that I think we could have some fun with. Uh, C Sharp has a lovely syntax for await async. Uh, we can achieve a similar effect by abusing generators, but it feels like an abuse. Any plans to bring await async as keywords to JS? Doug's going to say no. I've heard of no such plans. <laughs> so dealing with asynchronicity is something that has to be learned. And I see that a lot of people don't want to have to learn that. They'd rather play with the synchronous patterns. You know, they're, they're Synchronous functions and asynchronous functions. And everybody knows the synchronous functions because that's what you've always been using. The, the, you make a call to a function, you stop. Time stops for you until that function returns. And um, the way the, the browser works and the way node works is that you don't rely entirely on those kinds of functions. You rely on also on asynchronous functions, which are functions which return immediately and will eventually somehow communicate the result. Well, that's a different model, um, but it's a brilliant model. And once you learn that model, then things get really easy. And I see a lot of resistance from people who don't want to have to do that learning, who would rather have some transformer that will take a program that appears to be synchronous and transform it into something that's asynchronous. Um, but that adds, for me, a level of interaction which causes it to be more difficult to understand what the program's actually doing and to heal it when it goes wrong. So my advice is um, embrace asynchronicity because it's worth embracing. Yeah, I'll answer the question. Um, yeah, so, um, so I, um, I actually totally agree with, with Doug's point. I think um, one of the things that is true. People often want to say, how can we make uh, asynchronous programming as easy as synchronous programming? Uh, and, and I think you can't, because algorithmically, it is actually, there's, there's more cases you have to deal with. You have to deal with what's going to happen, what are all the other things in the program that could impact the state of the system during the period between when I start the operation and when I continue on that operation. Uh, and so that means that it is more complicated. You are going to have to deal with something more. Now, the, the, the thing you want to deal with in the language, though, you, you can't fix that part, but you can remove any additional sort of complications that the syntax of the language and the sort of structure of the language uh, puts on top of it. And I think what, uh, what C-sharp has done with async await is uh, one of the best approaches I've seen, and I think we've seen people using that, that uh, model in C-sharp 5 have found it really, really nice as a way of removing the extra layer of uh, language level cruft that gets in the way and leaving only the sort of algorithmic piece that Doug talked about, like only the sort of core piece of what makes async uh, different is, is what you have to deal with. Uh, so the, the question mentioned um, that you can sort of do async programming using generators, um, and I think that, that is true and that is a really um, good thing, and I think it's great that you know, it's in V8 now, you can try it out in Node, and you can uh, see people doing some interesting um, uh, experiments with how to apply generators to async programming in Node. Um, really what you want as a, as a delta on top of that um, to make the experience, uh, the delta between what you can do today with generators in, in ECMAScript and what you can do with C-sharp 5 
is really just a small amount of syntactic sugar. Um, and it, it is, uh, I'm actually planning on writing a proposal to exactly um, address that, um, that delta that to talk about is something we could do in ES7. Um, but, I, but I do think that, that that small delta would make it so that you could use um, all the mechanisms that we'll be building in with generators in ES6. Uh, you could build, use that as a foundation for actually doing really direct native um, uh, asynchronous programming in JavaScript. So we actually had a proposal from Google in May 2011 for a uh, defer and a wait, which is pretty much like this. Sure. Yeah. But it was, it was premature in two senses. One, it was clear that part of it was semantically generators. And so it's not an abuse of generators to build async libraries with them. They help you write more straight line looking code. You have to put in yield. But you can see the preemption points. It's very important if you're doing anything other than callbacks, which will get kind of deeply nested, that you can solve that. They, they can also entrain a lot of closure state, which can lead to memory leaks or other problems. You can manage that. But the generator-based task.js library and other libraries like that help you not worry about that and write simple code. The next step would be to include the other missing piece, which is a scheduler, and something like promises. And both of those are, are underway. But you know, first things first, generators are not just for asynchronous programming, they're really also the simplest way to implement the iteration protocol, very much like Python 3. And, and so generators are more primitive in, in the sense they don't entail an event loop turn, but we need to marry them to the event loop with a scheduler and promises and put it all together, and I think Luke's right, it'll turn out great. Um, the, the event loop is this mystery meet in the web standards right now, and I think he wrote a bunch of pros about it in the HTML5 spec, and there's some terms I, I, I searched in vain for the definition. So it's still kind of defined in only by studying all the standards together and sort of filling in some blanks. We're going to make it well defined, and it's going to be awesome. Yeah, and I think that is a key point, actually. The, the, it, the combination of doing generators um, in ES6 and all the work that's been going on with promises recently um, means you have the two foundational pieces in the platform that you could build a feature like, like C Sharp's async the weight on top of. Um, or or on the third. Or on the third, yeah. Um, so I think, I think it is really key that we do those pieces first, and then we look at how to layer or something like that on top, which is the same way that the C Sharp feature evolved as well. Uh, it's actually kind of a newer one, though, and nobody's really voted on it, but I'm come bumping you to the front of the line. Uh, there have been a few languages built on top of JavaScript, such as Dart and TypeScript. Which of these are most interesting to you and why? I'm going to start the microphone right down there. <laughs> so, um, I actually think TypeScript is really well done. It was also well um, launched, uh, but, it, but it actually has the right sort of embrace and extend. There's a third E word that Microsoft used to do, but I think, I can't remember what it is right now. <laughs> forgive and forget. Um, so it, embracing and extending, especially if it's in the concert with the evolving standard, is pretty smart. And the tooling looks great, and Andrew seems really into it, and Luke, I know, had a lot to do with it. So, huzzah. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, I, I, I've worked on TypeScript, so I am um, a fan of that. Um, but, I, but I will say something about, generally, um, languages compiling um, to, to JavaScript. I think there's obviously a huge number of these languages compiling to JavaScript. And Jeremy has this page up on GitHub that has like 120 languages that compile to JavaScript or something. Um, and then there's lots of really interesting um, things there. And there's sort of a whole spectrum of, of languages. And I saw you did a talk a while back that I thought was really interesting about Languages which, um, at one end, kind of uh, bring bring very little along, a very thin sugar over top of JavaScript, and they sort of um, add stuff for for the developer, but they don't really change the runtime semantics of, of the code that's going to execute. And then the other end of the spectrum is languages which bring a whole lot of uh, runtime stuff along. They want to make the the whole end-to-end -end development experience, including what you can do at runtime, feel very different than what JavaScript and the web platform feel like when you program to them directly. Um, and I think there's different 
different reasons to want different places along that spectrum. Uh, and I think if you look at things like, like as we mentioned, TypeScript and Dart, they sort of pick slightly different points on that spectrum where they'll fall, and then other solutions have picked um, even different points. And I think it's useful to have give developers options at, at several different points in that spectrum and sort of evolve and see what, what comes out of that space. Clearly with TypeScript, we, we've gone with something that's fairly, fairly simple sugar on top of JavaScript that doesn't ever um, generate much code on your behalf, um, but where you can try to generate a lot of developer value through types and classes and um, arrows and that sort of thing. So. I'm sorry, Rick, what was the question specifically about the languages? Uh, there have been a few languages built on top of JavaScript, such as Dart and TypeScript. Which of these are most interesting to you and why? Well, most interesting. Um, God, I don't know, most interesting. Um, you know, to be honest, I'm actually a pretty big fan of both um, Dart and TypeScript. Um, I had the opportunity after the last TC39, I had some downtime in Seattle, and I actually uh, re-implemented a JavaScript library, which is a utility library, which um, consumes DOM mutation observers and sort of provides a, a more useful view of what happened to the DOM. Um, and I, as an experiment, converted that to TypeScript, and I found it actually to be a really, really, really pleasant experience. I, I thought it was fantastic. I'm a really big fan of TypeScript. Um, I've had somewhat less time to actually code in Dart, um, but I think that uh, Dart um, took some interesting uh, sort of options in terms of trying to reimagine the DOM APIs um, and reimagine sort of a more complete environment, um, more complete environment saying it wrong. I think they were um, maybe trying to fix some of the things that they viewed as sort of fundamental flaws in the web platform or in the, or in the language, and I think the TypeScript wasn't taking exactly that approach. And I think that fundamentally they sort of appeal to a different type of programmer. Um, at least it's been my observation that you know people that come from a more strongly typed world feel more, feel more comfortable in something like uh, Dart, and I think it's fantastic that the web and JavaScript can support that diversity. So, um, so in terms of languages compiling the JavaScript, um, what I find by far the most interesting is neither of those, but is compilers of C and C++ compiling the JavaScript and the underlying support for those in the JavaScript platforms. And, uh, in the JavaScript engines. I mean, it's basically demonstrating we're back to my 30 to 40 years of the future of JavaScript is that is that JavaScript is becoming the standard virtual machine that other languages can be implemented in terms of. So that's what's, what's really, really cool. Um, you know, the first question was um, related to, you know, if you could do anything, what would you throw away? And then, to me, Dart is an example um, of you know some, some smart language designers saying, well, what I do is throw the language away and start start over again. But but when you throw it away, you throw away the whole ecosystem, the whole reason it's there and why it's important. And, and I think that's what Dart is fighting against now, trying to, to get acceptance or use. Dart also threw away some of the good parts, unfortunately. <laughs> that worked against them. Um, so the conventional wisdom in programming language design used to be that. Um, if it didn't have syntax that looked exactly like C, it was never going to catch on. Um, and that changed with CoffeeScript. CoffeeScript provides the same semantics as JavaScript. The only thing it has to offer is it doesn't look anything like JavaScript. And, and that's good, it turns out. Um, and, and so it is now having an impact on JavaScript. We're now trying to figure out how to put some of that coffee back in. Um, so, I don't know what changed, if it's just the winds of fashion changing, or maybe that we have um, new populations going into programming now, but the fact that we can have stuff that doesn't look like C is really encouraging. So, let's see here. Um, I don't know what you're going to do with you, so I'm just asking about modules. The spec is not finished, so much you can say about it. Um, what do you guys say? Should we take a modules question or two? All right. Um, let's see. Maybe you could just give a summary. Might be able to address it. Um, it seems the latest module and loader specs are leaning towards a build first strategy. Have we resigned ourselves to a code, compile, reload, dev cycle in ES6, where most current module loaders don't require compile during the development? Um, I don't know if that's true. Um, if you're working with Node, you have a 
a great advantage that requires synchronous, that in spite of the node doctrine, you should always use callbacks. And Brian Dahl said the Unix read system call should have taken a callback. Um, they actually read the file system synchronously to load code. You can't do that in the browser. So you can't nest an event loop when you want to go load some code either, or you'll lose all your invariants of data races. So part of the trick with modules to span the client and server is to add special forms, new syntax, by which we can prefetch the modules we need. The good news is that I think in the course of ES6, we're even recently just simplifying things down to almost what Node has, which is not worrying about concatenation, not worrying about um, modules that nest or the going line, those can come later if need be, but, but really worrying about out of line modules. And then people are already using build steps on the client, they have to, right? It, it, it seemed awkward at first, it's never great if you're just prototyping and you don't need to, shift reload, it still works. But once you get big, once you start putting it all together, and especially if you're using other things that need optimization or you're using you know, CSS um, front end languages, then the tooling just comes, it's part of the code culture. And we have possible thumbs, we're tool users, it's, it's okay. I don't think it's in you know, all good or all bad condition. But, um, but the basic out of the box ES6 modules, I think, will be a pleasant surprise to people who come from the Node and um, NPM require JS world. Yeah, I'll say actually one of the things that I, um, I've been most happy with, in a sense, with the modules work has been how um, it's been able to build upon the, the very, how highways were they? Um, that uh, the Node and, and Common and, uh, and AMD have, have paved. And, and I think that means that we have a lot of understanding of kind of what the usage patterns look like there. And things like this question of whether you need a build tool, we sort of know what the dynamics of that end up looking like in the AMD world from all the way from prototyping where you can very successfully use AMD without having a build tool all the way up to very large uh, code bases. Um, I know I've worked with some code bases inside Microsoft that are you know, hundreds of thousands of lines and are, are using complex builds um, with an AMD code base. And everything in between kind of works in a, in a way that we understand. And if we can map all that experience onto what we're doing with uh, with the module system inside uh, inside ECMAScript, then we, we can make sure that we develop something which, which can scale up in that same way and both across the client and the server. Um, I just thought the only thing I'll add quickly is um, in terms of dynamically modifying or updating a system or changing things, a really key thing isn't the, the set of modules that are linked in, but it's what data that's been created, you know, behind those modules that have been loaded, and whether you're trying to retain that data over a change or, or not. Um, um, you know, if, if, you, if, if, if you define a bunch of objects from a module and you instantiate them, and you can keep them around, and you want to throw away that module, then you get real issues. What, what's, what's that data? How, or how is that data? need to mutate, but, um, you know, if, if you aren't doing that, just, you know, dynamically swapping out or replacing a module, there, there are lots of solutions for doing that over time. Okay, uh, I have two thoughts. One is about that. So, Erlang did live upgrade. That, that was uh, quite a feat. And JavaScript has this big mutable shared store that's hard to do. But workers let you do it. I showed at JSConf EU, uh, version of our 3D first person shooter banana bread and on a screen in the game was mapped the free doom game and boom and so you could actually play the inner game or the outer game and the inner game was running in a web worker so you could actually unload it restart it workers are shared nothing that's it's a good thing there's there's pieces of this coming into the web platform we just need to fill in all the gaps and make it coherent um, the other thing i had a question for the audience who has used browserify here has it ever bombed on you? Yes. See, what we're trying to do by adding this new syntax, not much of it, really it's just export and import statements now, I think, is make it so you don't need browser reply. Make it so the browser can see where it needs to prefetch stuff. And the module loader, the system loader will do, do the work for you behind the scenes. And I think that's important. Otherwise, browser reply is like, oh, static analysis, that's easy, I can do that. Not quite. So two or three years ago, um, uh, modules was my most uh, favorite 
feature of the S6. Uh, I used to go down saying that if we did modules in the S6 and nothing else, we could say we did a good job. Um, it's no longer at the top of my list, mainly because it's late. And we're, um, we need to finish, he needs to finish the spec um, at the end of this year, if we're going to make um, 2014. And we still don't know all about what the modules. That's why we're being so bad tonight as to what's in it. it so I'm, I'm concerned that it's late. Um, I, there is so much other good stuff that's in ES6, I would like to not have that stuff held up. So Aaron, that answers your question about uh, what are the contentious issues, contentious issues <coughs> within GC39 that might surprise people. There was supposed to be a laugh after that. Um, so I'm going to do a pretty uh, specifically technical question, mostly because uh, uh, the team that I'm working with here at Boku, we're working on Firefox OS, actually uh, writing apps for Firefox OS um, with Mozilla. It's really exciting. We've got a great team. Um, just this afternoon, we were having a conversation about uh, private properties, private state, um, and, and managing that. Now, we have the luxury of writing JavaScript programs that actually take advantage of um, a lot of the new ES6 features that are already implemented in SpiderMonkey by way of Firefox. So, uh, especially now with the fork to 1.2, which is going to upgrade its uh, uh, the Gecko and SpiderMonkey, that it's bringing the Firefox, uh, what, what version are we talking about? 26 now? We, we going from like 18 to 26? Somebody over there on my team help me out. Four. Anyway, we're upgrading. I think we're actually going to get to use arrow functions soon, which is really exciting. But anyway, one particular pattern that we've, uh, we've come to know and love is weak maps. Somebody asked on here, um, let me find the specific question. Um, yeah. Why does weak map exist as opposed to being an option to map or something uh, inferred by the GC? Now, I wish, I really, really wish that Mark Miller was here. He was going to be here, yet last minute uh, something came up, wasn't able to make it. However, I think that Alan uh, is an incredible voice for weak maps, and I'd like you to take this question. Um, so, fundamental, does everybody here know what a weak map is? Probably not. So, so, you know what a map is. A map is a, essentially a keyed collection where you look up a value with a key and you get back some other value. Um, a, a weak map, and a problem you have with, with maps that you can have is, let's say you're using a map as a registry to keep track of all the objects that have some particular characteristic and some value associated with them. So, so you put to the map an object that has the key, and the, the value is, is some other object that's a collection of data you want to associate with that. Now, the problem if you just implement that way is if this map builds up all these objects as keys, and if the objects that are using as keys otherwise become garbage or would go away, the map is holding on to them, and, and so they never get garbage collected, and the values never get garbage collected. So, at its simplest, a weak map basically says, if a key of the weak map is something that would be garbage collected, if it wasn't there as the key of the weak map, garbage collected anyway. So, simply its use as a key it doesn't keep it from being garbage collected. Um, and, you, and that's safe because if you think about it, if it was nowhere else, then nobody can ever look it up in the map. So since they can't look it up in the map, it's okay to get rid of it. So that's what weak, weak maps are for. Now, why do you need to have weak maps as well as regular maps that aren't weak? Well, one reason is weak maps cost. There's actually work, extra work that the garbage collector has to do in terms of managing weak maps. And if every key collection was uh, was a weak was a weak map, uh, there would be a that would be a substantial overhead on the, the entire garbage collection process of the system. And I'll just throw in my background is as a garbage collector guy, so I'm really sensitive to that. So so that's my reason why you need to have weak maps to stick. Well. You, you 
you also want maps to be iterable, and, and you can't you can't ask for more app to iterate what is keys. Uh, yeah, well, that's actually a, a different reason. I mean, that, that's actually a security issue uh, uh, by, by design in the ECMAScript implementation. Um, so. But it's, not, it's not essential for performance. Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'll pass it back. We have concern about garbage collectors run on different schedules and different engines. And if you put a new RAM app, you might see that and come to depend on the order or the timing, the non-determinism of the GC schedule in one engine, and then your code would break in a different engine. So that's that's the security hazard that I want to mention. Um, the question also asked, why not a Boolean argument to map? I had to uh, cite this recently, I need to discuss, I'll mention it again. Aria Hayat has a great write-up called Boolean Trap. Just Google Boolean Trap and you will learn API design smells to avoid. Um, these really are different from maps. Could we infer it? So in Mozilla we have a language called Rust, which is um, interesting ahead of time language, like C++ with safety and concurrency based on Erlang or some of our Pikes languages that led to Go. And it's got something that's actually not in many other languages. It's a sort of lifetime annotation system. So you can say that this, um, this formal parameter uh, uh, doesn't live any longer than the, this, the receiver of the method, or things like that. Uh, it's pretty powerful, but you have to annotate. You can leave it out, it can be inferred, but you have to say it. JavaScript doesn't have any such thing, and it's really hard to analyze JavaScript and deduce the relative lifetimes in order to avoid kind of memory leaks automatically and, and clean up maps just because you happen to know something doesn't outlive something else. Um, the cost Alan mentioned is real, and we don't want every map to have to pay it. Uh, we don't want to make programmers pay a big annotation tax, so I think weak maps make sense. It's, it's a good tool, though. So the, the problem with weak maps is that they have such a terrible name. <laughs> so if nobody wants to put something weak in their program, why, why, why are we putting in the weak thing? It's, it's, such, a, it's such a great mechanism. Yeah, we have strong name. things. So it, the name is bad. And maybe we should spend three hours on a given name. <laughs> <laughs> Femorons would be great. Um, object registry, yeah. Let's take a quick poll. Weak map? Trash. Yeah. Ephemeron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Anyway, um, you know, so I, I think it's one of the best parts going to ES6. I'm really looking forward to weak maps or whatever they end up getting called. Just don't use them because they'll make your application so You use them for everything. Um, if you actually want to see some uh, real world, actually in practice uh, applications of weak maps, see anybody from Boku that works on Firefox OS, and we'd be glad to show you some example code that is uh, running, uh, soon to be running on production devices, shipped to hopefully millions and millions of people running on low power uh, touchscreen smartphones throughout the world. Uh, I'm going to go off the script for a second. Um, there's a particular question that, that uh, was asked of me and that I'm interested in, in knowing about as well because it's an important thing that uh, we here at Boku, uh, culturally, it's important to us. Um, what are your thoughts, generally speaking, on uh, diversity on this, com this particular committee and, and, so, and maybe talk about uh, what are things that we might do or we have uh, we have seen being done within the computer science community um, uh, and the software development community with regard to improving uh, diversity in, in in all general di diversity terms, so to speak. There's no specific topic. Doug, we don't have any, um, and and we could use some. Yes. Um, I don't know what it is about. I don't know what it is about. PC39, but women just do not want to hang out with us. <laughs> I, I can't explain it because we all seem like pretty nice guys, but um, it's just a bunch of, it's us, basically. Um, this panel looks like PC39. Well, I have a 
hyphen in my name, and so I mean, that, that says something about, I mean, that's the 1970s view of diversity, and my, and my wife is a quite well-known software uh, person, person in the software world. Uh, but, you know, we're quite senior and experienced people for the most part on this committee, and to have diversity among a senior group like this, you need to have start with diversity of junior people coming into the field and stuff. And um, I'm, as far as I can see, it's at least recently it's just not happening. Uh, when I started my career, actually there was a lot more diversity coming into the system and stuff, but very, very few of uh, the, the, the non-white males, um, you know, have, have lasted to where I am. I mean, my wife did in her part of the field, but not, not many others. But the bigger problem, I think, is there was a period um, from the, the mid-80s through the 90s where there was just very little input into the system of a more diverse population. And we're seeing a lot of that effect now, so. Um, So if you want to be part of PC39 and experience all the glamour and, and, and wonder that is what we do, um, you've got to do two things. One is you've got to get your company to join Atma. Um, if you're a big company that's 70,000 Swiss francs a year, you get, go for a cut rate. If you're in a university, you can join for free. Small companies can join for much less than 70,000. And two, you have to show up to the meetings. There's no membership committee, there's no vetting, there's no hazing, there's no nothing. If you belong to a member, you can just show up. So um, we are all self-selected. You know, nobody said, you gotta be one of us to, to be on the committee. We were on the committee because we showed up and convinced our companies to join. You can do that too. Yeah, um, it's funny, Luke and I were actually talking about this before the meeting started. Uh, we were both actually commenting that, that before everyone walked in, it was all guys, and it was refreshing to actually see some women. Um, I realized the question was sort of about diversity in general, um, and uh, I know that, at least in my experience, I, mean, I think TC39 is kind of too small of a sample size to, to, to get focused on, but at Google, um, at least my personal experience is there's far more racial diversity than there is uh, gender diversity. Um, and I was really, I, I'm, I'm really excited about like the thing that was mentioned um, before we started the, the encouraging girls to, to program. Um, I think that's that's really important. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I just think, I, I, Luke and I were having a discussion that I think generally, you know, I feel like better decisions get made when you have diversity, especially gender diversity. Um, and I, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, and we, we were talking about exactly this topic, and um, I think one thing, I mean, I'll just, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, I, I will say, you know, over the, I mean, it might have been about 10 years now, um, and I have seen substantial progress within at least Microsoft, and I believe that is generally represented in the industry over those 10 years, um, and diversity across many fronts, um, both gender and, and racial diversity. So I think there is some progress being made, but clearly, um, so, uh, Mozilla, we fund researchers. Uh, one of them is Philippa Gartner at the Imperial College in London. Her engineering students are doing a formalized uh, version of the ECMA spec using the metallurgical proof system COP. It's really um, impressive. It's not done yet by a long shot. Um, and she's impressive. I don't, I don't know if there's something about us. I think Partly it's the pipeline that Alan mentioned. I did a talk at THS where I showed a smoke-filled room, and this year it's smoking. Um, but I just came from JSConf EU in Berlin, and I'm friends with all the curators in JSConf circuit, and they, they have you know, fairly um, blind, you know, self-blinded techniques for selecting large numbers of, of women speakers, and they get a, a good mix. And it's important to do that. I have daughters. I do worry that this whole STEM thing has become kind of a, I don't know what it is, it, it's, it's part of the U.S. education racket. So um, kids are being pushed really hard to figure out whether they're going to be like hackers or engineers. And it's great if they want to, and if they don't, that's fine too. 
part of what was at JS CompU were designers and people talking about poetry, people talking about you know the other side of the brain, and that's that's extremely valuable. Uh, when you get into the nuts and bolts of writing down a language spec, you don't use that directly. But if you are only you know one side of your brain and, and you're only living there and, and sort of not paying attention to the whole world, the whole history and culture of not just computer science, but I would say language and history, um, you're missing out. Yeah, I have to add to that because I have a daughter who's 29, and so, uh, and um, she um, went to a, a school which was very STEM oriented, and she had a very, very strong background there. She was a national finalist, finalist in the Siemens Westinghouse Science Search. She uh, went to MIT and got an MIT engineering degree and uh, almost immediately decided, I'm going to go to journalism school. <laughs> uh, which is kind of a weird choice, <laughs> journalism. But, um, but, but it was largely because of the things you mentioned, because of the, the, the other side of the brain aspects and stuff. I mean, she remains very interested in, in science and technology and has become a data journalist, but it's, it's the combination of the, 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 the science and technology with other aspects of, of, of thinking and life that's really appealing to her. So, um, you know, I, I think a lot of women is, are more balanced in that way. One more thing. Um, so I, as, in addition to being a part of this community, I also have been involved in other standards groups for web technologies. And it's my general observation, at least from, from coming from Google, that uh, especially women are even less represented as, as representatives to those standards committees than, say, they are in the organization that they come from. And I don't know why that is. Um, I think it's unfortunate. Um, and I just, I, I, I think it's important that we encourage women to, to take those leadership roles um, and to be conscious of welcoming them into those settings. And, and, and at this point, I have to tell a joke that I, I, I used to use at Microsoft, uh, which was, you know, I'd say, um, um, so a good interview question is to ask somebody if they want to do standards work. And, 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 and the punchline was, if they, if they say yes, it's a no-hire. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, because really a lot of what we do is some of the most esoteric uh, you know, work work you can imagine, and you have to do it from the perspective of, you know, it has a really significant long-term impact, but you got to also sweat those details, and, you know, you just need to find the right personality. It's, um, regardless of, of gender or any other dimension, the vast majority of the people in the world would not be good standards people. So. <laughs> Uh, so this is actually going to be the last question, and I, I think it's a, it's a pretty good one. Um, what do you think about the culture of writing JavaScript? That is to say, both the way people interact in the broader community um, uh, and the organizational behavior that the language impacts what you like, what you dislike. I think this is uh, actually, I'm going to run all the way down here because you just came from JS CompView and, and I feel like have some relevant thoughts about such a thing. Sorry, I looked at Twitter and I missed the question. <laughs> gotcha. the, question the question was, uh, what do you think about the culture of writing JavaScript, both the way people interact in the broader community and the organizational behavior that the language impacts? What do you like, what do you dislike? So, I think it's good that JavaScript doesn't prescribe there's only one way to do it. I think that is part of the, like I mentioned, the rushed immutability and the relatively overloaded but few primitives. Like, if I had more time, I would have split out special forms like function, which serves at least double duty, if not triple duty, for constructor and, you know, top level sort of procedural abstraction and then sort of lambda high order programming. I wouldn't split it too much, but um, I didn't. And so, what we've had instead are different communities trying different styles, doing different experiments. Uh, and that's been good because, like I said, there's a large design space to search and uh, we need everybody working sort of cooperatively. What's the word, competition? We don't want people just queuing to one way, sort of, as a cult. We want people who try different things and compare notes. 
And we want a literate programming culture. Jeremy Ashpenaz is good on that. He's, he's trained, I think, in that at Brown. He wasn't really a CS major. Um, he was English and some you know, mad science option on the side. And he, he's influenced by Ruby, which led to a lot of CopyScript syntax along with Python. It's like the minimal intersection, or actually union of Python and Ruby. And part of that is, is based on his literary background. So I, I welcome um, multiple ways to do things and different trade-offs and some amount of localism. People should make their tools fit their job and their community and their, their area. Um, that's how the best tools are developed. Like, there's a professor at MIT, Eric Von Hibble, who talks about lead user innovation networks, how people, like plumbers, invented the tools that then kind of became standardized uh, at a higher level and mass produced. Or school sports were invented, like um, windsurfing was sort of user innovation created, or uh, modern running shoes. Um, and um, that, that's JavaScript. It's like uh, a bunch of little Nikes, a bunch of filled out ones, right? Yeah, I think basically just to agree with that, the you know JavaScript user base is, is probably one of the, the most diverse in a sense in terms of the kinds of uh, things people are trying to do with JavaScript to cover an enormous spectrum of people writing tiny amounts of script inside uh, web pages all the way up to building uh, very large applications that rival the largest applications being built with any um, major programming language out there. And so everything in between is this enormous spectrum of developers um, targeting that platform, trying to do things with that platform, and trying to build communities that support the kind of work that they're doing. Um, you see people, uh, so look, because of that, looking at JavaScript through a lot of different lenses um, and developing different communities, and I think that's really, really healthy that we have that. When you sort of look at it from the outside and look you know, from, the, from the perspective of the internet, you can sort of see these funnels that, that make it seem like it's much more uh, focused than it is, but I think really, at the end of the day, there are millions and millions of developers looking at this platform and, um, and working on it within uh, local communities, uh, and I think that's fantastic. So since I'm sitting in for Yehuda today, I think I'll channel him a bit. Um, so Yehuda wrote oh, this... I am my own man. Uh, Yehuda wrote this great um, article called The Extensible Web Manifesto that hopefully everyone has had a chance to read. If you haven't, please do so. Um, in many ways, it's sort of addressed to the web platform providers, but I think that it's, it's important for JavaScript developers as well. And in my mind, the best thing about JavaScript at the moment is that it's this really, really high functioning market. I think that the JavaScript community is able to lead the way. Um, I mean, I, I'm just, I feel like every time I'm, I participate in this medium, community, me, I'm remarkable. I can't talk. Um, I, I feel very aware of the extent to which the committee is paying attention to patterns that are established in the developer community. That it just comes up again and again. Well, this exotic, mostly from Brendan, this exotic, you know, the part of the community is doing this, and that's an example of this. And I think I think the community, in many ways, is leading the way. I think that's 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 the ideal situation. So, the thing that I guess most disturbs me, disappoints me about the JavaScript community, and I think this is actually more of a more about the whole web development community, but maybe it, there's a big component of it that's showing up in the context of JavaScript, is how many people, is, is that people learn it in too small a piecemeal fashion, where I think most programming languages and most environments in the past, there's a tendency would learn the language, or at least a major part of the language as a whole, and they'd learn how the pieces work together and how to, how to trade off them. And, and so many people doing web development have started with just learning one or two lines of JavaScript code or copying one or two lines of JavaScript code without really understanding it and kind of growing from that rather than developing an overall understanding. So I know it's not fair to generalize, um, but if you look at the community of people who are really good at JavaScript compared to the community of people who write in C Sharp or in Java, in general, the people who are good at JavaScript are smarter and better looking. <laughs> and I would also say better hygiene. So good <laughs> 
messed up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as I said, that was actually going to be the last question. Um, I've just been informed that I've gone way over time, which is okay, because I think we had a good time together. Um, so, that wraps it up. Um, feel free to hang out for a little bit. I'm going to hang over, hand over the mic to Boaz, who probably has a few words to say before we conclude the evening. But, uh, real quickly, I'd like to say thanks, guys. Really appreciate it.